Thank you, Cardinal Sean, for meeting with me today and talking with Spirit Fire in our conference. Um, it means a great deal. And as people are getting used to with our broadcasts, I'll save the, your wonderful biography uh, for people to read, which is provided with the video, and just introduce you as a true friend and inspiration for Spirit Fire survivors and, um, and someone who really has tended to survivors across the years um, as we've struggled forward to heal. Um, and we're focusing today not a, a lot on the institutional <laughs> church reforms and changes, but the church is a family, members to members healing together. And, and I really appreciate you talking with me about that. Um, we're, let's just start with the Pontifical Commission. And, and I think people don't always know what the Pontifical Commission does. So could you just describe a little bit, what do you do? Certainly, I'd be happy to. I know in the past there's often been confusion because uh, people have thought that uh, we were going to be uh, receiving cases and deciding. Uh, that really is the role of other dicasteries uh, in the Holy See. But ours, as Pope Francis said, he said, the commission's specific task is to propose to me the most opportune initiatives for protecting minors and vulnerable adults in order that we may do everything possible to ensure that crimes such as those which have occurred are no longer repeated in the church. The commission is to promote local responsibility in the particular churches uniting their efforts to those of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith for the protection of all children and vulnerable adults. And so uh, with that as our original uh, mandate, uh, we have been involved as a commission in outreach to survivors and survivor groups, uh, uh, studying and uh, promulgating or sharing with people the, the best practices and safeguarding, uh, coming up with norms and procedures that uh, uh, have been very has been successful in different parts of the world. We're also now involved in trying to promote uh, assessment of safeguarding, auditing uh, uh, procedures. And, and of course, one of our principal uh, functions has been that of education and formation, particularly of leadership in the church. And uh, trying to make sure that the priorities of the, the welfare of our children and vulnerable adults uh, and the principles of accountability transparency and zero tolerance are part of the, uh, the fabric of each of our local churches. And, uh, Is that one of the things that we had recommended to the Holy Father uh, mm -hmm. was to gather the uh, presidents of bishops conferences from the whole world uh, so that he would have a chance to uh, address them directly to, uh, to show the importance of safeguarding. And uh, that was, I think, a successful meeting uh, in many parts of the world. They're only beginning to talk about safeguarding. And uh, out of that uh, meeting came the Vos Estes document uh, on the accountability of bishops. And uh, I think that was a, a very important uh, contribution. No, thank you. It, it must be difficult because the church, the United States looks at the United States experience, but you're really talking about the entire world, all the different cultures, all the different regions that come to this with their own points of view about children. And even some of them are war-torn and, and the, the plight of children is blended with that. How does, how does the how does the commission deal with all that variation while promoting the safe 
care of children and vulnerable adults? That is a big challenge, but uh, the commission members uh, are really from all over the world, uh, from India and the Philippines, Oceania, uh, Africa, Europe, uh, North America, South America. And it, you know, working with these wonderful people who are so committed to safeguarding, you do realize that there are a lot of uh, cultural differences that uh, uh, need to be taken into account. But uh, uh, certainly one of the ways that we're uh, trying to address this is through the, the membership representing so many different cultures and also our uh, outreach to uh, the, the bishops' conferences in different parts of the world. And one of the things that we have become involved in it as a commission is working with the bishops, uh, being available to them when they come to Rome for their ad limina visits. The ad limina visit is a, an official visit that each bishops' conference does every five years to give a report on the status of their diocese and uh, uh, to meet with the Holy Father and the heads of the dicasteries in Rome. And uh, so we have been uh, meeting with, uh, with those bishops' conferences as they come. And there's always great interest in, on, on their part to learn more about the child protection. And uh, so this has been one of the ways that we have uh, addressed uh, yeah. the international uh, aspects of uh, child protection. Another very important one, as I say, we're involved with the leadership training. Uh, every year we're involved in the meetings that they have of all the new bishops who've been named in the last year gather in Rome uh, for a series of, of conferences and uh, it's an opportunity for us to, uh, to tell them about uh, safeguarding and their responsibilities as, uh, as bishops. We've also been very much involved in uh, a number of uh, uh, seminars with bishops' conferences and religious superiors all over the world. And, and during the pandemic, we've had a lot of uh, uh, webinars at, in conjunction with uh, the Gregorian University and the uh, major superiors who are headquartered in Rome. And in that way, we've been able to, uh, to reach uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, uh, leaders all over the world. And uh, so these are the kinds of things that we're trying to do. And it really, uh, has been challenging during this period of the pandemic, but the, the members have been wonderful in their availability and uh, their commitment. It's really wonderful to hear. And when you see also that it's not, it's just not one way. It's not just that you're training and that there's openness and, and effort to understand and grapple, but also amassing an appreciation across the globe and, and letting different cultures help each other know. And it's not always just the American culture that's giving out, but we're receiving a lot of lessons, which we'll be talking about as the conference goes through. But really it is a, it's, it's a, it's a it, you see a universal church at work and in dialogue within itself. And it's comparing that to, now, now let's just talk a little bit about your story, if you, if you don't mind. Um, compare that to, let's say, I, I was trying to think of a good starting point to your story as a priest, as a pastor, and of course, as a bishop. Um, and I was thinking of maybe Fall River would be a time to say, you would have really encountered some of the earliest cases of abuse that were coming forward. You would have been called to pastor people who were in enormous pain. Can you share a little bit about your experience caring for people way before this commission existed, even way before Americans, I mean, I knew because I was a survivor, but people weren't even aware. Um, can you share a little bit about that? Certainly. Uh, I was uh, already bishop in the West Indies and the Virgin Islands and uh, then 
was uh, named bishop in Fall River, Massachusetts, just at the time when the uh, Porter case kind of exploded. This was a serial pedophile uh, who had abused uh, literally hundreds of children. It was just a very, very tragic. Uh, and although he had been gone uh, from the scene for many, many years, he had uh, he was laicized long before I got there. But it, these cases were only coming to the surface. And, uh, and it really sort of erupted at a time when there, uh, when there was no bishop. And then I was named to go in. And uh, one of the first things I did was to try and meet with uh, as many of the victims and their families as possible. And that had a profound effect on me because I really didn't have any special preparation uh, yeah. to deal with the, the seriousness of these problems. But uh, listening to their stories, seeing their pain, realizing how some people's lives had been uh, destroyed by this, others had ended in suicide or addiction failed marriages and so many painful things. And not only the, the survivors and the victims themselves, but also their families and their communities and how much they were hurting. And so it became apparent to me that, uh, that so much of the neglect and the cover up uh, in part must have been due to the fact that people were unaware of just how evil uh, and how much damage uh, the sexual abuse of, of, uh, of children uh, can cause. And so right from the beginning, I have been trying to uh, encourage uh, uh, leadership in the church to meet with survivors, to have that experience. And uh, I asked Pope Benedict if he would meet with survivors when he came on his visit to the United States, and he did. And, and we presented him with a book of all of the names of, of victims that had come forward. And uh, we could see how transformative this was for him. And, and also very early on in Pope Francis's pontificate, when he was named Pope, uh, uh, I suggested to him that uh, he allowed me to set up a meeting uh, with survivors, and he did, and it was also a very transformative experience. And, and when we have these annual meetings with the new bishops who have been named from all over the world, uh, I always try and take a survivor with me. And uh, invariably, the bishops will come up to me afterwards and say, this was the most important uh, conference that we've had uh, in our gathering. And one of the most striking things that we heard was the witness and the testimony of the survivor that came with you to talk to us about safeguarding. And so I, I think that has been you know, a, a very important uh, part of my experience and also trying to promote that uh, with uh, with other leadership in the church so that people will come to understand uh, how much damage has been done and how uh, urgent it is for us as a church to respond appropriately. It's, it's very powerful from a survivor's point of view because we do, we come to share our stories and we actually can sometimes make of our stories a gift to other people and to other survivors by raising awareness, but it's, it, I'd like to emphasize something you say, what I see is it's so hard for people to grapple with the depth of this evil. And so it really takes a conversation of, of mutual regard and, and relative safety because it's a very, it, it's just hard no matter what, no matter how familiar you are with the issues of the spiritual world, it's, it's very difficult. Um, and it's wonderful to know, it's wonderful to know that the folks were, were listening and also that you're helping bishops hear from survivors to see 
in human terms what that is. Um, if you fast forward, I mean, that was, that was quite, it was a little bit before because you were only in Fall River so long. And then there was the Spotlight series of articles in Boston that, that was an expose on years of abuse and corruption. Um, and then there was the Dallas conference where the Dallas Charter for the Protection, for the, the Charter for the Protection of Children and Young People was passed. So that year, I think it was 2002, it's one of our watershed years we're asking everybody. It's when we saw a lot of Catholics become really, really aware of this um, on a different level. What was your experience of that year? A lot happened. It, you know, eventually you ended up being moved to Boston. Yes. And actually, after uh, 10 years in Fall River, I went to Palm Beach, where I replaced uh, two bishops who had been removed. And after less than a year there, then I was uh, named to, to Boston. But certainly, uh, as you say, that was a watershed year. Uh, yeah. the, the work of the Spotlight team, the, uh, the charter, uh, and all of these things, uh, obviously, my reaction was like all Catholics. We were uh, shocked, dismayed, ashamed, angry, uh, and concerned uh, on how we could go forward. And uh, but I was pleased at uh, at the work that went into the the charter and the uh, openness of so many bishops to. Uh, try and look for radical solutions and uh, to embrace uh, the uh, priority of the, uh, of the victim survivors, uh, the need for uh, zero tolerance and transparency and accountability. Uh, that, uh, yeah. So it, I also felt that it gave us an opportunity uh, as a church to embrace our mission uh, to really uh, make this a civilization of love and to help uh, to root out uh, child abuse, not only in our own church, but in society. And, uh, uh, and I think we were horrified to realize that uh, so much harm had been caused by uh, the failure of leadership to uh, address these crimes. And, uh, but it also, I think, uh, galvanized uh, people into action. And uh, I think that was a, a very uh, important moment. And uh, the church in the States uh, uh, was changed uh, drastically and permanently uh, by, by those events. It's very powerful. I know I've heard you say that before when you've spoken, and I can't agree more that even in the darkest moment, there are these evangelical aspects where in turn, in, in, in overcoming as a church our own failure, we can also then bring more healing other places because as a survivor and i know most survivors are keenly aware that there are are victims everywhere and that there's suffering everywhere that we would hope to bring awareness first to stop abuse everywhere not just in the church but also to bring healing to people whether or not they happen to be harmed in the church um when you when you were in boston and of course i'm a survivor so I will admit that, and you know this from other times, I'm kind of ambivalent sort of the, it's not the leadership issue I'm interested in is, as a pastor, how did you, and inevitably that meant that you were a leader as a bishop, but as, as a, with a pastor's heart, how do you, you have survivors, you've spoken to how our families are hurt too, but you have clergy that's hurt, you have parishes that are hurt that this happened. 
how do you walk forward with the hope for healing? How, how do you hope in those situations? Well, one of the things that we did uh, in Boston early on was to have a, a novena of healing where we, uh, for nine days, went to nine different parishes where there had been the highest incidence of abuse that we were aware of. And, uh, and we, uh, we had processions going to these churches. We brought priests and, and survivors and parishioners and prayed, prostrated ourselves on the ground, asking for forgiveness, listening to the witness talks of the survivors. Uh, that was a very uh, powerful experience. And yeah. uh, it helped uh, those parishes, I think. It also was a path uh, of people coming back to the practice of the faith. And uh, we've tried to have uh, masses at the pastoral center for survivors and their families uh, and, uh, where people can uh, uh, come to uh, to be reconnected to the church without necessarily going back to their parish if they're not ready to make that right. step. And, uh, and that's also been a positive uh, experience for us. It's very, it's lovely. That's a lovely way to make somebody feel safe. I know that from all the survivors that we encounter, sometimes it takes so much to go back into a church, but you can maybe feel safer with your bishop or also, they're just places that become safer. And it's wonderful just to try to find those. Um, when you, you know, as a Franciscan, as a, and as you look at this across this arc of time, how do you deal with this evil? Just yourself as a person who's devoted to the spirituality of St. Francis, and of course, a person committed to our Lord, how do, how do you grapple with this in our own church? Well, I think our interior life, a life of prayer, is where we find the strength to be able to, to cope with evil, but also our firm conviction of God's love for us and that our God is so good and so powerful that he can bring good out of evil and that he can change people's hearts and, and, and bring us healing and hope uh, for the future. And uh, I have found so many people uh, truly committed to safeguarding and, uh, and their love for this mission and for the church uh, have made a big impact uh, on me. And, uh, it's funny you say that. I, I have to say in all my life, I've never known so many amazingly well-grounded people. You don't work in this without being well-grounded and working out your issues because it's a very difficult thing to be around. But it, the people working in Safeguard, there are many and they're, they're committed and they're quite amazing. Um, after all these years, how do you, has, has, how is this, I suppose you could ask this of anybody at any point in their life, but at this point in your life, how do you feel that this experience, because really when you think about then when you went from Fall River and there was Florida and there was Boston and then this commission, you've really been somehow called to play a role in the both the reform and the healing of the church in this very difficult area. How has it affected your priesthood and the priesthood that you share with people on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, obviously when I went to the monastery to become a friar and uh, I had no inkling that this is what so much of my ministry was going to be about. And yeah. so I think you learn that God in his uh, providence uh, is, is caring for us and guiding us as individuals and in the church. And uh, I th that has been uh, a source of, uh, of consolation to me in spite of all of my uh, inability and uh, mistakes and but God never gives up on us and he 
and he does allow us to share in his mission and that is very humbling and i often share with my priest that uh, there's a wonderful book written by a scripture scholar where he talks about jesus's uh, priorities and of course if someone asked me what jesus's first priority would have been i would have said announcing the gospel but this man studied the gospels and analyzed that Jesus' first priority was healing. And it's in the context of healing and mercy that the good news can be announced. And unless the church uh, is able to bring healing to this terrible situation, we will not be able to announce uh, the gospel, the good news of salvation. And so... This is a very, very important task. I feel very humble for, uh, for being asked to be a part of it. And uh, I'm so grateful for all of the wonderful people I've come to know that are committed to safeguarding in our church and in society. It's a beautiful thought. And it, 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 from the survivor point of view, it's also, it wasn't until coming back and being fully healed. It's not that therapy and other things are important as part of the patchwork of healing, but I've come to see that our faith itself is the antidote to the very things that have happened within our church. And um, it just echoes from another angle what you're saying, that there's, it's, there's something here that's nowhere else. Um, and with that, as we've kind of wind up, and uh, do you have any message you'd like to offer to survivors and our families as we listen to this? Um, Certainly. Well, first of all, I, I want to thank you, those who have come forward. I mean, by uh, sharing uh, in your stories and, uh, and listening to your witness and seeing your courage. So that has been a transformative experience in my life and in the life of our church. And once again, I want to ask for forgiveness uh, for all of the harm that has been done, for the failures of our church, and urge you to never stop believing in God's love and never stop helping us to be able to bring healing and to promote safeguarding and hope, even in the midst of this world that's now so distracted by the pain of the pandemic. And I just want to thank you, Teresa, for all that you do uh, you're a real light for all of us, and uh, God bless uh, you and all of your collaborators for the wonderful work that you do with Spirit Fire. Thank you. Thank you, Cardinal. I'm going to turn our...